Memoirs of Constant. Introduction. The life of a man obliged to make his own way, and who is neither a mechanic nor a tradesman, does not ordinarily begin about his 20th year. Until then he vegetates, uncertain of his future, neither having nor being able to have any definite end in view. It is only when his powers have attained their full development, and his character and propensities at the same time incline him towards such or such a part that he can decide upon the choice of a career and a profession. It is only then that he undertakes himself and sees his surroundings clearly. In fine, it is at this age only that he begins to live. Reasoning in this fashion, my own life, since I attained my 20th year, has comprised 30 years, which may be divided into two equal parts as to months and days, but which could not differ more widely if one considers the events which passed during these two periods of my existence. Attached during 15 years to the person of the Emperor Napoleon, I have seen all the men and all the important things of which he alone was the rallying point and center. I have seen still more than that, for I have had under my eyes in every circumstance of life, the least as well as the most serious and most private, as well as those which belong the most to history, and already form part of it. I have had, I say, incessantly in view, the man whose single name fills the most glorious pages of our annals. Fifteen years I have attended him in his journeys and his campaigns at his court and in the privacy of his family. Whatever step he might decide on, Whatever order he might give, it was difficult for the emperor not to take me, even involuntarily, into his confidence. It was without my own will that I more than once found myself in possession of secrets which I would frequently have preferred not to know. How many things occurred during those 15 years in the emperor's vicinity? You lived in the midst of a whirlwind. It was a succession of swift, bewildering events, you were dazzled. And if you tried to fix your attention for an instant, another flood of incidents came with a rush which carried you off your feet without giving you leisure to consider them. At present, these times of dizzying activity have been succeeded for me by the most absolute repose in the most isolated of retreats. And again, it is an interval of 15 years which has elapsed since I quitted the emperor. But what a difference! What is there left to do nowadays for those who, like me, have lived amidst the conquests and marvels of the empire? If, in the vigor of manhood, our life has been blended with the movement of those years so short, was so thoroughly occupied. It seems to me that our career has been long enough to sufficiently well filled. It is time for us to betake ourselves to repose. Me may well withdraw from the world and close our eyes, but what is there left for us to see which can compare with what we have already seen? Such spectacles do not occur twice in a man's lifetime. After having passed before his eyes, they suffice to replenish his memory during the rest of the time he has to live. In his retirement, he has nothing better to do than to occupy his leisure with the memory of what he has beheld. And it is this which I have done. The reader will easily believe that I have no more customary past on than to recur in fancy to the years I spent in the emperor's service. As far as possible, I have kept myself acquainted with all that has been written about my former master, his family, and his court. What long evenings have slipped by like moments while my wife and my sister-in-law have been reading these aloud to the family. Whenever I encountered in these books, some of which are really nothing but miserable rhapsodies, statements that were inexact, calumnious, or false, I took pleasure in rectifying them, or rather in proving their absurdity. My wife, who lived like me, 
and with me in the midst of these events also acquainted us with her reflections and explanations and with no other object but our own satisfaction she noted down our common observations all who came from time to time to see us in our solitude and who took pleasure in making me talk of what i had seen astonished and too often indignant at the falsehoods which ignorance or bad faith have vied with each other in retailing about the emperor and the empire evinced to me their satisfaction with the information i was enabled to give them and advised me to communicate it to the public but i have never dwelt upon this thought and was very far from imagining that i might some day be the author of a book myself when monsieur l'advocat arrived at our hermitage and urged me with all his might to publish my memoirs which he proposed to bring out himself at the time when i received this visit which i was not expecting we were reading in the family the memoirs of monsieur de Bourrienne, which had just been published by the firm of l'advocat and we had more than once remarked that these memoirs were exempt from that spirit of depreciation or infatuation which we had met with so frequently and not without disgust in other books treating of the same subject monsieur l'advocat advised me to complete the biography of the emperor which monsieur de Bourrienne, on account of his high position and customary occupations had been intent on displaying merely in its political side after the excellent things he had said of this it still remained to me according to his publisher to relate simply and in a manner suitable to my former position near the emperor that which monsieur de Bourrienne had necessarily been obliged to neglect and which no one could know better than i I willingly confess that I found but little to urge against Monsieur Levacot's arguments and that he ended by convincing me when he made me reread this passage from the introduction to Monsieur de Burian's memoirs. If all the persons who approach Napoleon, no matter at what time or place, will frankly record all they saw and heard without any sort of prepossession, the future historian will have an abundance of materials. I desire that he who shall undertake this difficult task may find in my notes some hints that may be useful to the perfection of his work. And I, too, said I to myself, after having reread these lines attentively, I can furnish notes and explanations, point out errors, stigmatize falsehoods, and make public what I know to be the truth. In a word, I can, and I ought to bear my testimony in the long trial which has been going on since the emperor's downfall for i was a witness i saw everything and i can say i was there others also have seen the emperor and his court at close quarters and it must often happen to me to repeat what they have said on this subject because what they know I also was in a position to know, but what I, in my turn, know of details and what I can relate of a secret and unknown matters no one else has been able to know, nor consequently to say before me, from the departure of the first consul for the campaign of Marengo, where I attended him, until the departure from Fontainebleau, where I was obliged to leave the emperor. I was absent from him only twice, the first time for th three times, 24 hours, the second for seven or eight days, aside from these brief holidays, the last of which was necessary in order to restore my health. I quitted the emperor no more than his shadow did. It has been claimed that no man is a hero to his valet de chambre. I ask permission to hold a different opinion. The emperor, no matter how close at hand he might be seen, was always a hero. And there was much to be gained by seeing the man in him also, nearby and in detail. From a distance, one experienced merely the prestige of his glory and his power on approaching him. One enjoyed in addition and with surprise all the charm of his conversation all the simplicity of his family life and i am not afraid to say 
the habitual benevolence of his character. The reader, curious to know in advance the spirit in which my memoirs will be written, will perhaps like to find here an extract from a letter I wrote to my publisher on the 19th of January last. Monsieur de Bourrienne is perhaps justified in treating the political man with severity, but that is not my own point of view. I can only speak of the hero in deshabillé undressed, and then he was nearly always kind, patient, and seldom unjust. He became much attached and received the attentions of those whom he liked with pleasure and good nature. He was a man of routine. I desire to speak of the emperor as an attached servant and in no wise as a censor. On the other hand, I do not wish to make an apotheosis in several volumes with regard to him i am somewhat like those fathers who recognize defects in their children blame them severely but at the same time very readily find excuses for their faults i beg pardon for the familiarity or if you like the impropriety of this comparison on behalf of the sentiment which inspired it for the rest i propose neither to praise nor to blame but simply to relate what is within my own cognizance without seeking to bias the judgment of anyone. I cannot finish this introduction without saying a few words about myself in reply to the calumnies which have pursued even into his retirement a man who ought not to have enemies. If, in order to avert this misfortune, it were enough to have done a little good and never any evil, I have been reproached with having abandoned my master after his downfall with not having shared his exile. I will prove that if I did not follow the emperor, it was not the will to do so which failed me, but rather the possibility. God forbid that I should here depreciate the loyalty of the faithful servants who remained attached to the last to the emperor's fortunes, but perhaps I may be permitted to say that. However terrible was the downfall for the emperor himself, the situation to speak here of per purely personal considerations only was still honorable enough for those who remained in his majesty's service and who were not detained in France by an imperious necessity. Hence, it was not personal interest which led me to separate myself from the emperor. I will explain the motives of this separation. The truth will also be made known concerning a pretended abuse of confidence, of which, according to other rumors, I was guilty. With regard to the emperor, the simple recital of the misapprehension which gave rise to this fable will suffice, I hope, to clear me from all suspicion of indelicacy. But if additional testimonies are needed, I will invoke those of the personages who lived in the greatest intimacy with the emperor and who were likewise in a position to know and appreciate what passed between him and me. Finally, I will appeal to 50 years of an irreproachable life and say, in times when I found myself so situated that I could render great services, I rendered many, but I never sold them. I might have derived advantage from the measures I took for persons who, as a result of my solicitations, have acquired an immense fortune, and I have refused even the legitimate profit, which, in their gratitude very lively at that epoch, they thought they ought to offer me by proposing that I should have an interest in their enterprise. I never tried to take advantage of the benevolence with which the emperor so long deigned to honor me in order to enrich or secure places for my relatives, and I retired poor after 15 years spent in the special service of the richest and most powerful sovereign in Europe. This said, I will await with confidence the judgment of the reader. Chapter 1. I shall say very little about myself in my memoirs, for I do not blink the fact that nothing in them can interest the public but details concerning the great man to whose service my destiny attached me during 16 years and whom I hardly ever quitted throughout that period. Still, I shall ask permission to say a few words about my childhood and the circumstances which led me to the post of valet de chambre to the emperor. I was born December 2nd, 1778 at 
Perules, a town which became French at the time of the reunion of Belgium and the Republic, and which then found itself comprised in the department of Jemaps. Shortly after my birth, my father took the little establishment called Petit Chateau at the Baths of saint Amand, where persons lodged who came to take the waters. He was assisted in this enterprise by Prince de Croix in whose house he had been steward. Our affairs prospered beyond my father's expectations, for we received a great number of illustrious invalids. When I had just reached my 11th year, Count de Lure, head of one of the first families of Valenciennes, was one of the residents of the Petit Chateau, and as this excellent man had taken a great liking to me, he asked my parents to allow him to bring me up with his sons, who were near my own age. At this time, it was the intention of my family to educate me for holy orders in order to please one of my uncles, who was Dean of Lacine. He was a man of great learning and austere virtue, thinking that Count de Lure's proposition could make no change in his future projects. My father accepted it, believing that a few years spent in so distinguished a family would give me a taste for learning and prepare me for the more serious studies I would have to make in order to embrace the ecclesiastical order. I set off, therefore, with Count de Lure, extremely sorry to leave my parents, but at the same time, very glad, as is usual, at my then age to see a new place. Count de Lure took me to one of his estates near Tours, where I was received with the most benevolent friendship by the Countess and her children, and was treated on a footing of perfect equality with them, and given daily lessons by their tutor. Alas, I unfortunately did not profit long enough by this kindness of the Count de Lure and the lessons I received in his house. Hardly a year had elapsed since our installation at the Chateau when we heard of the king's arrest at Varen. The family in which I found myself experienced profound despair on account of it. And child as I was, I remember that I keenly regretted this news without being able to tell myself why, but doubtless because it is natural to share the sentiments of those with whom we live. When they treat us as kindly as the Count and Countess de Lourdes had treated me, nevertheless, I was still in the happy thoughtlessness of childhood when I was awakened one morning by a great noise. Presently, I found myself surrounded by a considerable no number of strangers, not one of whom was known to me and who asked me a host of questions, which it was quite impossible for me to answer. I learned then only that the Count and Countess Delure had emigrated. I was taken to the municipality, where the questions began again in a fine style, but as uselessly as ever, seeing that I could only respond by the abundant tears I shed at seeing myself abandoned in this fashion. And far away from my family, I was too young then to reflect on the Count's conduct. But I have thought since that my abandonment itself was an act of delicacy on his part, as he was unwilling to make me emigrate without my parents' consent. I have always had the conviction that before his departure, Count de Lure had recommended me to some persons who had not dared to claim me, lest they should compromise themselves, which, as everyone knows, was then extremely dangerous. Here I was then, at the age of 12, without guide, support, or shelter, without advice or money, more than a hundred leagues from my native place, and already accustomed to the amenities of life in a good family. Who would believe it? In this condition of things, I was regarded as a suspicious character, and the authorities of the place required me to present myself monthly to the municipality for the greater security of the Republic. I remember perfectly more over that whenever it pleased the emperor to have me relate these tribulations of my childhood, he never failed to repeat several times, the imbeciles, in speaking of my worthy municipal officers. However, the authorities of tour concluding at last that a 12-year-old child was incapable of overthrowing the republic, gave me a passport with the express injunction to leave the city within 24 hours, which I did very willingly, yet not without a profound uneasiness at finding myself afoot and alone on the road with a long journey to make. By dint of many privations and much trouble, I finally arrived at the vicinity of Saint-Domain, 
which I found in the hands of the Austrians. The French surrounded the town, but it was impossible for me to enter it. In despair, I sat down on the side of a ditch and was weeping bitterly there when I was noticed by Major Michaud, who afterwards became colonel and aide-de-camp to General Lasson. Major Michel came up and questioned me with much interest. He made me tell him all my sad adventures and seemed touched by them, but showed me how impossible it was for him to have me taken to my family, having just received a furlough which he was going to spend with his own family at Chinon. He proposed that I should accompany him thither, and I accepted with lively gratitude. I could never express the kindness and care showed me by the family of Mr. Michel during the three or four months I spent among them. At the time, Monsieur Michel took me to Paris with him, where I soon found a place in the house of one Monsieur Gobert, a rich merchant, who treated me with the greatest kindness at the time that I remained there. I saw Monsieur Gobert recently, and he reminded me that when we traveled together, he was careful to leave one of the seats in his carriage at my disposal, on which I lay down to sleep. I mention this circumstance with pleasure, since although otherwise of small consequence, it shows Monsieur Gobert's kindness towards me. Some years afterwards, I made the acquaintance of Carat, who was in Madame Bonaparte's service while the general was still on his Egyptian expedition. But before saying how I came to enter the establishment, I think it will be apropos to begin by relating how Kara himself became one of Madame Bonaparte's dependents and at that time some anecdotes concerning him which are calculated to throw light on the earlier diversions of the residents of Malmaison. Cara was at Plombier when Madame Bonaparte went there to take the waters. He carried bouquets to her every day and paid her little compliments so odd and even troll that Josephine was much diverted. So were the ladies who accompanied her, among whom were Madame de Cambie and de Crigny, and especially her daughter Hortense, who was in fits of laughter at these pleasant trees. The fact is that he was extremely amusing on account of a certain foolishness and a sort of originality which did not prevent his being witty. His drolleries having pleased Madame Bonaparte, he completed them by a sentimental scene at the time when that excellent woman was about leaving the watering place. Carat wept expressed as well as he knew how the keen regret he would feel at not seeing Madame Bonaparte daily, as he had contracted a habit of doing, and Madame Bonaparte was so good-natured that she did not hesitate to carry him back with her to Paris. She had him taught the trade and then attached him to her service in that capacity of hairdresser and lackey. Such at least were the functions he fulfilled when I made Carette's acquaintance. He used an extraordinary freedom of speech with her, so much so that at times he even scolded her. When Madame Bonaparte, who was extremely generous and always good-natured to everybody, made presents to her women or chatted with them familiarly, Carat reproached her on account of it. Why do you give that? He would say and then add, that is the way you are, Madame. You begin joking with your domestics. Very well. Some fine day, they will fail to respect you. But if he tried to put obstacles in the way of his mistress's generosity when it extended to others, he was at no pains to restrain it where he was concerned himself. And when anything took his fancy, he would say bluntly, Don't you want to give me that? Bravery is not always the inseparable companion of wit, as Carat proved more than once. He was endowed with one of those artless and insurmountable dispositions of poltroonery, which in comedies never failed to excite the laughter of the spectators, and it was a great amusement for Madame Bonaparte also to play tricks on him, which displayed his singular caution. The reader must know in the first place that one of Madame Bonaparte's greatest pleasures at Malmaison was to walk on the high road bordering the walls of the park. 
She always preferred this promenade, where there were almost continual clouds of dust to the delightful alleys inside the park. One day, being accompanied by her daughter Hortense, Madame Bonaparte told Cara to follow them in their walk. He was in a state of great rapture at this distinction, when suddenly there arose from one of the ditches a large figure draped in a white sheet. In a word, a real specter such as I have seen described in translations of some old English romances. It is needless to say that the phantom was simply a person expressly placed there by these ladies to frighten Carat, and the comedy certainly had a marvelous success. Carat, in fact, no sooner caught sight of the specter than he came up to Madame Bonaparte in alarm and said to her, all in trouble, Madame, Madame, look at that phantom. Tis the ghost of that lady who died lately at Plombier. Keep quiet, Carat. You are a poltroon. Ah, it is certainly her ghost that is coming back. As Carat was talking in this way, the man in the white sheet carrying out his part came toward him, shaking his long veil, and poor Carat seized with terror, fell over backward, and became so ill that every effort was required to restore him to consciousness. Another day, while the general was still in Egypt, and hence before I became a member of her household, Madame Bonaparte wished to give one of her ladies a notion of Carat's fear, a general plot was got up between the ladies of Malmaison, in which Mademoiselle Hortense played the part of chief conspirator. I've heard the story told so often by Madame Bonaparte that I can give some rather comical details about it. Caress slept in a room adjoining a small cabinet. A hole was pierced in the partition between them, through which a string was passed, at the end of which was hung a jug full of water. This cooling vase was suspended exactly over the head of the patient. Nor was this all, for they had taken the precaution of having the screws removed, which kept Caress folding bed in place. And as the latter was in the habit of going to bed without a light, he saw neither the preparations for his premeditated fall, nor the vase containing the water destined for his novel baptism. All the conspirators had been waiting for some minutes in the cabinet when he threw himself heavily enough on his bed, which instantly sank under him. The watering pot, meanwhile, responding to a jerk on the string and producing the effect intended. Simultaneously, the victim of the fall and a nocturnal inundation, Kirat protested loudly against this combined attack. This is horrible! He shouted with all of his might. The malicious Hortense, meanwhile, in order to increase his tribulations, saying to her mother, to Madame de Cugny, Madame de Charvet, and several other ladies of the household, Ah, Mama, the frogs and toads that are in the water have just fallen on his face. These words added to the profound darkness merely served to augment Kara's terror. And becoming seriously angry, he cried out, It is a horrible thing, Madame. It is an atrocity to place such tricks on your domestics. I would not venture to asseverate that Caress complaints were entirely out of place, but they merely served to excite the gaiety of the ladies who had taken him for the butt of their pleasantries, however they may be. Such were the character and the position of Carat when, after I had been some time acquainted with him and General Bonaparte had returned from his Egyptian expedition, he told me that Monsieur Eugène de Beauharnais had applied to him for a confidential valet, his own having been detained at Cairo by a rather serious malady at the moment of departure. This man was called the Febra and was an old servant entirely devoted to his master, as all persons must have been who were acquainted with Prince Eugène, for I do not believe there were ever existed a better man, more polite, more full of consideration, and even attentions for the persons in his service. Cura, having told me, therefore, that Monsieur Eugène de Beauharnais wanted a young man to replace Lefebvre and proposed that I should take his position, I had the happiness of being presented to and suiting him. He was even kind enough to say to me, on the very first day that my physiognomy pleased him greatly and that he would like to come to him at once. On my part, I was enchanted with this situation, which 
I don't know why, presented itself to my imagination under the gayest colors. I went without loss of time to find my modest luggage, and there I was, valet de chambre ad interim of Monsieur de Beauharnais, never thinking that I would one day be admitted to the special service of General Bonaparte, and still less that I would become the chief valet de chambre of an emperor.